Hi, and welcome to Yifed Adventures. My name is Darren, and this channel is about backpacking, cooking, and finding your next adventure. In today's video, we're going to be listening to a talk by a illustrator of a world-renowned book, Richard Lowe, and he's going to explain to us the meaning behind some of the Asian history, and well, let's go check it out. This afternoon program, we have two guest speakers. Rich Lowe came from Chicago to give us a quick uh, a presentation um, about his work on the Tai Sing a book, a Mountain Chef. So, uh, and he's got an interesting story. He's going to tell us about a lot about it and so forth. So I won't go into that further. I want to thank the crew for including me in this pilgrimage. Um, certainly, uh, a lot of people are responsible. The Chinese Historical Society of Southern California with uh, Eugene Moy and Susan Dixon and then Jack Chu and um, also my driver Howard Wang who uh, brought me here safely 400 miles and the 70 Nessie National Park with Yan Yan. Is she here? Thank you very much for uh, all you do. So I want to talk a little bit about my background as far as how my family got here. In the 1940s, my grandfather uh, wanted to do business abroad. And he wasn't able to get into the United States. So his village had some uh, business going in Panama. So he wound up going to Panama. There he, uh, he had a little store behind a saloon. And uh, he also took on a second wife. Uh, my grandmother was still in China at the time. So with the second wife, there is a child, uh, a boy, that we don't know who he is at this point. So, in 1957, my father took the family on a boat to escape communism and wind up in Macau. And from Macau, we got to Hong Kong. So my father is a, was a composer for the Chinese opera and also the band lead. So by leaving China, he was afraid that he, he was going to be prosecuted as an intellectual. So as soon as the Cultural Revolution, 19, excuse me if I'm wrong, 1957, he left China and my aunt got into the University of Wuhan. So she stayed there. So in, in Hong Kong, uh, we have Three brothers, I have three brothers and three sisters. And my parents, there's nine of us. And it was very hard for him to make a living as a musician and feed 90 miles. So my grandfather came back to Hong Kong to help. The funny thing was that um, he was making a lot of money in Panama, enough to tell people he was successful. So in 1958, he won the lottery in Panama. So he had to leave Panama because he would have been robbed. So he went back to Hong Kong to celebrate his 60th uh, birthday. So a big gala. Uh, right after that, uh, my Aunt Betty, who, uh, uh, who arranged marriage, married, married a third generation American in Los Angeles. And uh, so he spon she sponsored my grandfather and my grandmother to the United States. So there, my grandfather was a butcher. He was uh, a, a bartender, and he learned Spanish from Panama. So it was sort of a jack of all trade. As you all know, that our grandparents were extremely brave to go to all the obstacles uh, in the world, like for for, for Chinese Americans. So in 1964. 
uh, my Aunt Betty sponsored my family to the United States, and we set foot in Los Angeles. Our first house was um, a rental on the uh, foothill of uh, the Dodger Stadium. I don't know what the name of that hill is. And I enrolled in second grade at a nearby grammar school. Later, I used this experience to write a book called New Year. And it's sort of about my experience as a second grader. And as a first, um, it would be the first English class I ever taken in this school. So it's quite traumatic, as you know, as a four, six year old kid. And um, so sometimes I would recollect visually of my past. Uh, I never learned to write. Um, I was a product of the Chicago Public School System, which is uh, pretty bad. So after one year in Los Angeles, we traveled by train to Chicago. And in Chinatown, we set roots. Chinatown in the 1960s was an insulated, pragmatic neighborhood that is behind time. Work hard, don't go off course, I head towards an idealized American dream. That was a neighborhood model. I did not fit that. I was rebellious. I hung around with some bad people. And in my last year of high school, I was involved in it indirectly in a shooting incident in Chinatown. I needed to run. I enrolled at Eastern Illinois University, downstate Charleston, as an art major. But that was the only school they accepted me. From there, my life changed forever. At Eastern, I blew off the first year of my school year, freshman year. The habit of just getting by was still with me. At first, I was impressed with the freedom of being on campus. Louder. OK, I will. Um, so at first, I was impressed with being free. The freedom was kind of impressive for me, because living in an insulated neighborhood, everybody knows your name, everybody knows your, your, your habits, everybody knows everything. And being at Eastern, I can walk around in, in anonymity, and I thought that was great. But I didn't know that there was a cultural change to come. I ate American food and mingled with white people every single day. I discovered drugs and alcohol. Chinatown and its philosophy is rapidly drifted away. I wanted to fit in into the culture, to be an American. I don't want to speak Chinese, nor do I want to let others know that I am an immigrant. After two years, I seldom go home to Chinatown. School was just a place for me at the time. I didn't study, and I did not understand what education At the beginning of our sophomore year, I was suggested by the teaching staff to apply for a talented student award. I submitted some watercolors, and at no time I thought I could win. But to my amazement, I won a scholarship and a $700 stipend for a semester. And even at that time, I didn't understand the value of the education. The final year of my bachelor of years uh, degree, I was approached by an outgoing professor named Carl Shaw. We were just sitting around, just talking about what we we're going to do with our art degree. And he suggested that um, I should apply for graduate school. 
and that there was an assistantship waiting for me if I said yes. So I told them that, hey, I didn't have the GPA, nor the capability of passing and entering examination to graduate school. He said, take a month to think about this, and if you say yes, we'll take her to rest. And he said that with an assurance that he would do that. So after a month in Chicago, I decided to take this scholarship and, this, and the opportunity now to redeem myself with all the gifts that the school have given me, and I am still a, I'm still a squirrel. So I decided to make some life changes. I no longer played frisbee and smoked pot in the court. I went to the library. I knew learning about art wasn't enough. I need to fall in love. I need to fall in love with this process. I aim to be an artist for life, but not in teaching. Because of my drawing ability, I received work quickly in advertising after college. I made enough money to raise two kids and with a stay-at-home mom. This year marks the 39th year of my independence after graduating from college into the workforce. In 2012, uh, I met my agent, uh, Anna Oswanger from New York, through an email. And to, th to this day, I have never met her. <laughs> we may have talked 10 times on the telephone, everything through the email. And she said, just write words and we'll figure out there's a story in it. I wrote nine vignettes from memories of living in Hong Kong from age one to five. And from those nine vignettes, we picked a, a writing called Father Chinese Opera. And it took two years, many, many edits. We make our presentation to the New York Publishing House. A company named uh, Sky Pony Press picked up the manuscript, and I remember my agent telling me, Rich, you're not a published author, which is an, an impossible task. And that Father Chinese Opera won the Asian Pacific American Library Association Award for Honor Book. So that's the first time I visited San Francisco to receive the award. And then, 2015, I got a request from Charles Bridge, a publisher in Boston, Massachusetts. It's called Mount Chef. First, I took in references of Tai Sing and the, the group of dignitary that he took up the mountain. There was approximately 200 photographs that had the screen to it. <coughs> and I thought it was very interesting that they would pick me to do this, to do this uh, book. And I told them that uh, not only I'm Chinese, I have worked in the kitchen. So to them, that was a magic word. Like, I'm, I am drawing a picture of a cook and I have understanding of cooking Chinese food. So, this is where I started when I first read the manuscript. <clears throat> and usually, we don't do a cover first, but it was so important for us to establish Tai Seng that I, I did a cover for that. Mm. I never wanted to do children's work from the get-go, so I didn't want to do cartoony stuff work. So I did a very serious, realistic sketch of Tai Seng. To all, the, all the photo references. And this was rejected. So you want to go to the next side, see the color, side, the color one. And it was rejected. They want Tai Seng to be a character, which I think we really disagree, but I, I guess uh, 
I, I really have a choice to say. I, my hands are tied when you work for these public schools. Mm -hmm. Is there another after this? Okay. So, so I started sketching. I got the manuscript, and there is a, uh, this is what we call a title page. And you have the, the, the credit from the publisher. I thought it would be nice to have Tai Sing as a child when he learned to write English and, and, and Chinese. Look on the horizon, look for his dream, because he wasn't going to be uh, a laundry guy or, or, or a cook, or I mean, he was a cook, but to work, to work like the, how, we, how they used to work in, in the towns. So he wanted to be in the mountains. And the mountains, you know, it's just cold enough. Okay, the next. So I want to establish a town. So I did some research on, on Chinese in the Western town. And I submitted these sketches. You know, it, it, it's very realistic, but they did not like it. The next one. They didn't like the, the look of the face. They, they really thought it should be friendly. But once again, it's not truthful, right? But, but because it's a children's book, I, 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 I would listen to what they say more than not. So now Tai is a caricature. And, uh, so I submitted three options against the code. One more. They said, well, it's a second option. And a third option. And they take the first one. So now we establish what it looks like. So the process of this technique is, uh, number one, when I submit uh, samples, I want to make sure that I'm, I create samples beyond their expectation. Uh, this way, it's a, it's a really shortcut to approval. They, they didn't expect it, that certain quality. They, they, uh, it would be faster. So we go down to the next one. So this is the cover. So what I did, I scanned in my pencil art that I've done on uh, tracing plate. And I put in these, these watercolor. They are done by hand, but scanned in. So I can layer them like real watercolor, because the real watercolor is transparent. So with that, I create this style with I uh, repeating to other books too. So, um, if you go to the next, the, so now I, I start to lay out the pages. And I knew that with this book, I want to leave white spaces for the text because there's big blocks of text. And actually, this, this is more text than needed for a book uh, for children, I think, mm -hmm. K, K to 6 or something. But the style lends itself to the space where they can put the text. So. I, so in this way, I help design the book, so I know that my illustration is in the right places. Sometimes you have to do that um, to get ahead of their thinking, and once again, it's a shortcut for approval, to approval. So I need to study Stephen Matter's face without being realistic. So it took quite a few tries to get sort of caricature. In this case, he's meeting some of the dignitaries to convince them to do this trip. And they hired Tai Singh because they wanted the best cook available, and Tai Singh had that reputation. So they hired him, so he started gathering up supplies. So it creates scenes that tells the story without actually reading the text. So I want to make sure that in this in this illustration, they are greeting, right? With the Capitol building in the background. So we know that this is government. And on the other one, it's on the other side, because Tai Sing now is preparing for this trip while he's gathering the dignitary to for, for this trail uh, trail work. So the text said he gathered uh, peaches and a side of bee. So this is all imaginative because all I have references is are the stove and some of the, the pots and pan. Yeah, so everything else, I want to make sure I, I can be imaginative without going outside 
of what the actual products are, actual uh, items are. And uh, sketching, he had to, now he has an assistant called Eugene. So now we added another another scientist. There you are, Eugene. Yeah. Eugene. Your hair is just as long, just as long. But to fill in pages, um, I usually add a background. So I added some of the, uh, the white uh, uh, hikers or um, outfit or uh, whatever you call them. Just to add some other context that you know they're not alone. Just to say a, a national park before it becomes a national park. So once again, I'm using the spread in the middle, the the, the, the spine of the book, to divide the illustration. But yet, I, they're actually combined. So on this side, they were scouting for. Uh, campsites or potential campsites or where they're going to go that, that morning. While uh, the rest would sit around drinking coffee with Eugene serving them. And all that type of serving them. So it's actually two drawing, but the way it's composed, it is one drawing. So in this scene, they, they were saying that, well, the, 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 the outfit is going off to scout. Ty Singh and Eugene stay behind to make food. When they come back, there'll be food for them. And once again, it's, it's, the, it, it's the same concept. It's actually two drawing, but by the time, because there are two sets of blocks, two blocks of, uh, uh, of copy. But I want this to be a spread, which is like one scene. This is one of my favorite uh, scenes because I was able to do some landscape art for, for the park. Yeah, they might not be 100% accurate, but I want to add that element that they're in this wilderness, a wide uh, open space environment. And of course, the trees are kind of fun to do. So these pencils are very, very quick drawings. And the reason I like it, because they look fresh and unrefined in some ways. And that's the style I want to portray. It's not refined. We're not, I'm not spending hours and hours refining the drawings. I want them to be quick. That's why I draw on tracing papers. And if I'm here next year, I will bring some original of the drawings. But, so this describes how the, how Tai Sing and Eugene set the table. They're, uh, they're, they're done nicely with uh, uh, table prop props like the, the pine cones. They have uh, cloth napkins. They have fine uh, uh, plates and cups and silverware. And of course, his famous biscuits. That he made with uh, it's a, it's a uh, buttercream or sourdough sourdough, sourdough, sourdough biscuit yeah. that he baked in that oven that he has a horrible oven. So in this scene, I want to I want I want to show off the table, but I also want to put Mather and his friends uh, in the background waiting for their meal. Then. The meal got away. <laughs> All the stuff is gone. So I want to show a distant mountain and a hitching post where the donkeys were tied or the mules were tied. And they and he came and he was surprised. So he was angry, but there's but as I said Chinese man, I can say that he he's already thinking about what am I going to do? Well, Matthew and his party would say, whatever, just get it done. The next. Of course, he was, he was a hero, um, made fine dishes, and on this scene, the party salutes him. But I want to set up a night scene, which is very hard in watercolor. So what I did, okay. 
So on the nice seat. So what I did was I applied the watercolor, and at the end I put white to create the the, 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 the hot part of the fire. This is magic. To me. I'm not doing anything realistic. So this so the whole book on these illustrations is implied action. Okay. So this one Yen Yang was talking about. This one of my favorite spread myself. So I have I have this action which I thought was great. But the publisher thought if I didn't put the bottom here, it would look like it's fallen off a cliff and died. And you don't want that in the children's book. So I added uh, <laughs> but still, I mean, I, I really thought that I, I captured this really good. Um, I think the mill survived. Yes, it did. Yeah. Yes, it, did. Yeah. <laughs> it, it says, uh, it says uh, at the bottom, the mule shook himself, itself, and scrambled back up. It was fine, but the food and gear were not. <laughs> so once again, he's coming to obstacles. So here we have uh, bent silverware mm -hmm. and all his equipment is damaged. But the crew still want him, want the food, right? They're, they're not concerned about whether you're having uh, damage. I want our food. So in this book, I want to show that they're okay with it, but they're waiting. As it says, uh, uh, Tai Sing stumbled into camp with. I can't, I can't do that for that far. But anyway, show that they're, they're waiting while he's figuring out what he wants to do. So this is my favorite scene because there is a photo reference of this particular scene. What I'm Tyson, so I, I made up Tyson cleaning up the, the table, walking while everybody's saluting him. And once again, the, the way I did um, the watercolor, we do a seed. I, I urge everybody to come see the book so you can see the colors. That um, how unusual it is to use watercolor to create lantern, lit lanterns. And it took a while for me to figure this out. But part of what's beauty about creating artwork, what our parameters, is that you can experiment and find solutions on the real time, on the spot. In this scene, this is the, um, the, the, the one, uh, fortune cookie scene, right? So he's writing fortune cookie while everybody's in the ice. And Eugene's cleaning up. And, um, so the next scene. So then, then we're talking about if this, how fortune cookie looked back then. So because I'm working with a mainstream publisher, I have to let them know this is a fortune cookie. I let the kids know, right? of how we interpret fortune cookie today. So, um, what's that? There's no references of anything from, from, from the photo. So I had to make this up and it worked, worked pretty well. Um, I don't know where the saying from. I think it, it was part of the manuscript that she wrote. So I didn't make this up. It sounds, it sounds like, it, it looks and sounds like a, a fortune cookie message. The last scene, we decided not to put any text and to show him leaving the park with his equipment for the next journey. So this is the final. I can't read it. Whoever can read it. So to, to come back now, today, um, I felt that I didn't put our journey, my journey, your journey, as an importance going forward. And um, two projects this year is, uh, made me change that mind. I want to show you a mural that I just finished in, uh, on the west wall of the Chinese American Museum in Chicago, China. And with this platform, I felt that this is my responsibility to be active and make sure that I get enough opportunity to speak about our culture. But the past is important, as I realized, talking to all of you, how important the past is. But the way I, I fought racism, 
on my life and is to be them, to win the jobs, to, 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 to. I think it's a, it's a competitive thing that I always had. But I know that I, I don't have a voice. I'm not a writer. I'm not an activist. But I can use my artwork. And when we get to the, the mural, you'll understand why. So uh, moving forward, um, how am I going to do this? How am I going to uh, help preserve our heritage? So the book is one thing. Public arts is another. But I feel that um, my contribution to organizations that are responsible of preserving our culture can better use my artwork. Uh, whether it's posters, whether it is um, uh, whatever it takes uh, to, to further our mission via artwork is something I can control. So um, I would like to extend my help to this organization or any organization that's committed to preserve our culture uh, with my artwork. So uh, that, I think that contribution I can I can be at my best, and and it's not only for us, right? It's for our future, for our kids, and I want them to see that there is an urgency to understand our past. And I and I know that the way I do things may not be uh, ethically right uh, according to the rules, but I always did things with the right intention, but never made on the right path. Exact path, but the results going to be there. And uh, and I, of course, I understand racism. I'm not trying to deny racism because I experience that every single day in America. So if the, if the way I approach it may or may not you may not agree, but I think the result is we're, we're in the same place. I got this opportunity from uh, City of Chicago who helped finance this mural, and two organizations. One is called Coalition for Better Chinese American Community, and a, and a company called SiteWorks, who designed environmental uh, outdoor environment for the city of Chicago. So he approached me saying, that, hey Rich, uh, we got some money. Uh, will you be interested in doing a mural? I'd never done a mural this size before. I said yes. Like I, like when the public, my agent asked me if I can write, I said yes. Even though I can't. <laughs> but that never, never stopped me from doing things. So I submitted three designs. Um, Chinese opera was one of them. And they did not hesitate to pick this one. Okay, so, uh, so I thirst on this mural is three prominent opera actors. You have Shin uh, Ho, you have Mo uh, Kuai Yin, and you have Guan Kung. So I thought these three characters is iconic, and you don't need a lot of thinking. Okay, those are the, the, the opera actors. The challenge is that they have a ramp. So everything, the scaffold and the ladder, had to be uneven for me to be able to paint this one. It's 33 feet by 22 feet with a door. There's a door here. They also want to paint it. <laughs> the wall was in excellent shape. And I didn't have to wash it or do anything else except prime it. So you want to go down? So my background the reason why I think the Chinese opera was a, a good a good to pick is that I'm familiar with the opera because my because of my father, and so when my father my father was an up up and coming composer in Hong Kong when he immigrated, and once he stepped foot in this country, he never ever did another opera. He was a, a cook for the rest of his life. 
So Chinatown in Chicago is a vibrant uh, community with small shops, mom and pop. So every day I get a bow. I want, I want to immerse myself in the neighborhood because I'm going to be here for 45 days. Mm -hmm. And uh, I go to small shop, store, and every time I, I eat a meal, I, uh, I promote them on, on social media. But because of the mural now, I have a larger audience and it helps at least spread the word. So this is how it began, right? Um, a wall, I go around using an extender to prime the wall white. The reason is that it needs to be seen. The color needs to be seen. The wall color is brown, and I will not be able to see the color. And there, it's a grid system. So as you can see how big the face is, yeah. some, of the, some of the picture will show you how I had to go to paint some of the Lastly, I put my family name on the mural. I thought that was important, that the family takes credit rather than me. And since it's the opera, because it's going to be part of my father who passed away in 2017. So they never get to see this mural with his name on it. The fire burns it. I know. So that's my heart. Four riches on a challenge right now. <laughs> Now stop talking. I know you're going to Don't talk to me. Don't talk to you. Here. 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 No, just <laughs> 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 Yeah, okay. I want that dark soy though. It's in a jar. It's in a jar. Yellow jar. What are you going to cook up here? Um, si jiu tao mi. Si jiu tao mi. Okay. Si jiu tao mi. Different style. No, it's just a thick soy, right? Thick soy, yeah. Thick soy. Wow. What is that? What is that? Uh, sorry. 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 Okay, forget it, forget it. Too late, too late. It's too late, it's too late. Did you ask? No, let me go. See you there. <laughs> Uh, and the oh, I need black bean too. I need, I need that black bean. Okay. 
Okay, turn it off. Uh, you want to hold it? I hold it. Just okay. Pretty okay. no, 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 no. good. What's your name of the dish? Uh, pepper steak chow mein. Uh, okay. You can try it. Chi No. Thanks for watching eFit Adventures. If you like content like this, please like and subscribe and hit that like button. Till next time, take care and let's find your next adventure.